Welcome to everyone. I'm so pleased to be moderating this panel on teaching public interest technology through a multidisciplinary lens. My name is Deirdre Mulligan. I'm a professor at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. And um, we have a terrific set of panelists today to talk about their work in a diverse range of institutions um, exploring the interdisciplinary nature of PIT training and education. So we're going to hear from about four different projects that are introducing theories and practices from different disciplines. Um, for me, in, interdisciplinary teaching and research is both the thing that keeps me going every day and one of the most difficult things I've ever done. And I think that we're going to get some really terrific insights from our panelists today about both their triumphs and their struggles. So I'm going to really briefly introduce everyone so we know who's in the room and then we're going to jump in and have, I'm sure, a very animated conversation. So because Paul's here, Paul Ohm first um, is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, um, one of my alma maters. Um, he specializes in information privacy, computer crime law, intellectual property and criminal procedure. And he teaches courses in all these topics and more as the faculty director for the Center on Privacy and Technology. Lydia Chilton, assistant professor of computer science at Columbia. Um, and her current research is in computational design, how computation and AI can help people with design, innovation, and creative problem solving. Next, Christopher Garonson is a distinguished service professor at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Chris, teaches classes in geoinformation, spatial, oh damn, I missed that up, um, data visualization, and at the intersection of design, innovation, and analytics. Um, very importantly, Chris was previously at 18F, an office within the General Services Administration, started during the Obama administration, um, managing digital services consulting strategy and design projects for the federal government. Which, um, really provides him some novel insight into some of the work that we do here. Next, Mihir Shirsharga is the Technology and Policy Clinic Director at Princeton. He runs Princeton's center. It's the first of its kind interdisciplinary technology policy clinic that gives students and scholars an opportunity to engage directly in the policy process. Um, and he came from an uh, active um, practice in consumer protection and tech policy at the state AG's office. And next, Stacy Dogan, a professor of law at the University School of Law, Boston. Um, and Stacy is a leading scholar in intellectual property, competition, and technology law, who's been really instrumental in building interdisciplinary and interinstitutional collaboration in the areas of law, technology, and entrepreneurship, and has been teaching uh, um, interdisciplinary class with some colleagues in computer science or in algorithms in the law. So as you can see, we have folks coming from a diverse set of backgrounds, um, even within uh, the academy, but then also with some really interesting um, outside experiences that I think really inform the way in which they think about the importance of interdisciplinary work. There's nothing like trying to do this work out in the wild um, to drive home the need for collaboration and interdisciplinary perspectives. So I wanted to jump in and start with Mihir um, and say, you know, why are you teaching the course that you're teaching? Um, why did you identify the need for technologists to inform policy debates? What is it that, that really drives the work you're doing? Thank you, Deidre. That's, that's a great question. Um, so I, you know, my background is as a prosecutor and I was litigating a big case against internet service providers in New York. And I discovered that a lot of the kind of fundamental technology questions were open. They were things that were hard to understand that you needed expertise um, of different kinds to be able to help answer these difficult problems of how do you ensure that there's access uh, to broadband? How do you ensure that companies are being truthful about what they're saying? And so when an opportunity came up at Princeton CITP to run a clinic with computer scientists and help them uh, and other interdisciplinary people address these problems and learn together. Uh, that was a great opportunity. I decided to jump at it and working with Ed Felton, who's the founding director of uh, CITP, he was the one who sort of conceived of this idea. 
uh, it's been a wonderful ride of working with students in, in individualized projects. So I've really enjoyed that. So Chris, same question to you. Um, why do you think interdisciplinarity is so important to the work that you did at 18F and the teaching that you're doing now? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think, I think interdisciplinary uh, students or, or people with different backgrounds are, is really critical because if we're talking about public interest technology, we need to be thinking about how digital services um, and other ways in which government engages um, the public uh, is used by a variety of different people. And so what I found in my classes is that the most creative ideas often come from those with diverse perspectives. Um, and we're fortunate that we have yeah, at Heinz College, both a public policy school as well as an IS school, but we also get students from the business school and the design school. And a lot of our work has to do with, uh, you know, really doing a lot of user research. So they, they have to interact with people that are expected to use government services. So that multidisciplinary lens really lends a hand, I think, to making sure that we're, you know, as much as possible seeing the problem we're trying to solve from a lot of different angles. So at the risk of looking like I'm leading with the men, I actually am going to ask Paul next. Um, and it's not because I'm leading with the men, but it's because uh, Paul is going to round us out with his perspective from the Federal Trade Commission and I think a bit of his connection to OSTP. And from that policy lens, why do you think interdisciplinarity is so important to building the public interest technology field? Yeah, I spent a year as a senior policy advisor at the Federal Trade Commission. I did interact a lot with OSTP. I also spent four years at the Justice Department as a computer crime prosecutor, so similar to Mihir's background. I mean, the work of the Federal Trade Commission in particular um, is all about new technology and technology platforms and just pick up a headline from the last, you know, 10 years and, and you'll see that borne out. Um, when I was there, I had the privilege to work alongside two different chief technologists, which was still a little bit of an innovation at the agency uh, and one that continues to today, although a little bit in disrepair under the current administration. Um, and it's just amazing how a little bit of technical interdisciplinary engagement still goes a long way in the world. I mean, one thing I tell my law students, I get law students at Georgetown who don't have a technical background. I say, you know, the world doesn't have enough people with formal training. And so we need to find ways to give you a little bit of interdisciplinary engagement and you'll be surprised how many opportunities will open for you. Um, I, I hunger for the world 10 years from now after all of our collective efforts work out where my law students are actually not gonna be able to get those opportunities, honestly, because we're gonna bring together subject matter experts with the lawyers, with everyone else. Uh, we have to, like the world is fundamentally broken <laughs> and this is one small way we can uh, take a step toward fixing it. So Lydia, as the most junior among the group here, um, you know, you're obviously part of the hope for the future of building this field as an assistant professor. And what is it that, you know, obviously I think as academics, we all know there's some risk in doing interdisciplinary work, right? There's a lot of encouragement to kind of stay in your lane. And I'm wondering what has brought you to center interdisciplinary teaching and research in your work. Oh, yeah, great question. So what I fundamentally teach is computer science students how to make apps, the websites, mobile apps that people will use and will want to use. And there's an art to this. It involves the human centered design process, but rather just like thinking of something and just building it and then see if it works. You test things along the way, you come up with a lot of ideas. Uh, anyway, there's a general process there. But um, there's a general dissatisfaction, although that process works well, there's this criticism of Silicon Valley, which I think is true, is that it's, if you look at things that are being designed in the tech world, there's people who are in the tech world, um, and that there's a broader set of, of people that we can and, and should be designing for. And I realized that my students, who largely just had computer science backgrounds, they, they needed some help with that. And I think it's just there's more opportunities. We've, we've done an awful lot of the low hanging fruit and just like, oh, take something that happens in the real world, make, make an app for that. So like social networks, there's a lot to be done. And there's, um, there's, but there's, there's much more out there. And so we wanted to figure out like, how can we find other people who know some of that? So we partnered with journalists and um, urban designers and architects who often work within communities and for communities and then had to adjust the human-centered design process so that we could 
make use of that expertise. So that's what I'm excited about. I think maybe the same as others. Um, there is this huge gap between tech and largely non-tech, and, and they both benefit from um, being able to, to cross the, the wires. So that brings me to you, Stacey. And um, law schools are kind of notorious for being kind of these silos unto themselves. We don't generally have PhD students. We don't have postdocs. Our students are kind of like laser focused on acquiring the knowledge they need to be lawyers. And so are a little less likely to venture off and take courses in other departments. And yet you have been really actively developing some of these interdisciplinary classes, both in your role as an individual faculty, but I think also in your role as Dean for Academic Affairs. And I wonder if you could talk about um, why you view it so, as so important to the public interest technology field and to kind of the vision of a law school of the future. You're muted. I had to be the one to do that, huh? Um, my, so my thoughts about this um, pick up, I think, where Paul left off. I think we're hoping that our students are going to go off and become leaders um, in as policymakers, as uh, act regulators, as um, as lawyers. Um, and in order to do so effectively, our law students absolutely need to understand. Uh, the technology um, that they will be engaging with and the, and the developers of that technology. So one of our principal goals really is to increase the fluency across the disciplines, to increase um, the ability of um, lawyers and policymakers and regulators to engage with, talk to, and understand the developers of technology um, that they are both uh, regulating, but also using as tools to address um, social challenges. Um, but the fluency has to go the other way as well. And um, we, I think as a society, and we've seen this over the last couple of days in these panels, um, we've been fetishizing a certain type of smarts in technology, right? Better, faster, um, you know, um, uh, quicker, smarter, right? Um, but the people who are studying computer science and other um, fields of technology in our society don't necessarily have a sensitivity to the ethical, legal, um, and regulatory environment in which they're innovating. And so part of our goal is to increase um, the communication across fields, not just between law and computer science, but also um, to get our philosophers involved, our ethicists involved in these conversations so that we're educating um, these interdisciplinary communities of people who are sort of interested in the, the whole range of challenges that technology can help to address, um, but also um, can help to um, confront us with. So one of the things that there seems to be quite a bit of commonality is um, uh, the use of experiential learning as a place to help people kind of develop these multiple fluencies or to get some experience, both collaborating with people from other disciplines and to gain some knowledge from other disciplines. So I'm wondering if um, each of you, and we're gonna start with Chris, could talk a little bit about the kind of methods you use in your interdisciplinary effort. And so I, I know it includes experiential learning, but my guess is it also includes design methodologies and other things. And kind of what's the connection between the method and the sort of interdisciplinary fluency you're trying to develop? Yeah, sure. So, so in our class, the Policy Innovation Lab, uh, well, first it's a short class, it's only seven weeks. and. The goal that we really explore with the students is how how do you identify a really big challenge uh, and figure out small pieces of that challenge that then you can start to fix you know, through the identification of the problem you're trying to solve. So we do merge a lot of uh, methodologies. Um, we use an agile methodology to help the students figure out how to set up and structure their teamwork. Um, we use design thinking and human-centered design to help them always think about 
who the government product or service that they're trying to design ultimately benefits and what the impact that service has. Um, and then we use other prototyping methods and deployment methods um, to think about how to create a real tangible, impactful method. So for us, really, the goal is showing them how all of these various pieces work together to ultimately solve a problem. And that's a pretty, I think, critical learning objective of the course is to really, through that experience, working side by side with an actual government partner, understanding how they can actually make a meaningful impact in government through the combination of these uh, multidisciplinary practices. So Mahir, I'd love you to pick up on this question. And in particular, you're a lawyer, you come from you know, a practice and you're sitting at Princeton, which doesn't have a law school. Um, and the clinic actually has a, a history of both having lawyers as visiting fellows and also having them lead the clinic. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about like what's the teaching methodology there and what's important about the, the legal skills you bring into that non-legal environment. Yeah. And, and I should just clarify that there's, there's a center which has existed for, for a long time. The clinic is a new project which just started last year with, with me. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the key things, I came to Princeton because it didn't have a law school, right? There are too many lawyers in technology, to, to Paul's point. You know, when, when you're a litigator and you, and you investigate a company and you say, where, where did the company go wrong, right? And you don't want to get after them when it's all over. Uh, you want people when they're making these decisions to have the ability to think about the impact their decisions are having on our communities and for them to have that sensitivity uh, to actually engage in the policy process. And what you see is that students, computer science students, feel inhibited because they feel that there's this strange language of law and regulation and we can't break that down. We don't have a voice there. And so one of my key uh, things is to try to bring that in and, and bring projects around specific policy problems so that students understand that they actually do have a voice, that they have something to contribute, that they have the ability to make a difference. And, and I'll illustrate briefly one, one thing that I'm doing is we have this case studies uh, section where we, we bring in a real world policy problem uh, and we bring faculty, uh, graduate students, fellows, postdocs, there's no hierarchy, it's sort of everyone coming in. And we spend an intensive session just understanding the problem. And then in the second part of this, proposing solutions to the policy problem. And then if there's something more to go on, uh, we, we develop further projects on it. So this is a way to get people in very deep. I think sometimes um, in interdisciplinary work, we try to show the breadth of everything there is. And that's you know, then they basically become lawyers, which is not a good thing. Uh, they, they have to be, you know, they have to understand that how to have a voice in the particular area of expertise that they're good in. Uh, and that that's one of the goals. So Lydia, I'm wondering in your teaching, do you have, is it problem centered or client centered? Um, you know, we've been hearing about clinics, which often are very client centered. Um, what approach do you take to kind of center people on, as you were talking about, kind of the human problem oriented and, and what do you do there? Yeah, so we've actually run the class twice and we learned a lot from, from the first version. One thing that we did well is pick a, <laughs> we try not to use the word client. We don't like any of that sort of capitalist language and yet <laughs> we haven't quite found anything different, but like, a focus area, just like Mahir said, you there is this tendency to go broad and there are so many problems, but how do you solve a lot of problems? You solve one well, and then you knock down the other dominoes. And we actually really struggled um, to find a focus area because none of us, the, the architect, the journalist, the computer scientist didn't already have like an area where they were doing this. And so um, we, we went with public libraries I think someone had just read Eric Kleinenberg's book about how great libraries are, palaces of the people. And I was like, okay, let's do that. And, you know, New York has a lot of libraries that it has. So we um, found them partners within the Queens and Bronx public libraries to work with that could help 
answer questions, give guidance, give some of that depth. The students also did a lot of reading um, to get themselves familiar because no one was an expert on libraries going into this. Although everyone had some amount of personal experience with it. So it wasn't quite like the law where so the average computer scientist has no concept, like just don't break them. <laughs> sort of the, the idea, but ever, so anyway, we had to, we had to um, deepen that, but um, finding an area that we could apply technology to that was already in the public interest was I think critical to us to having, helping students develop public interest technology. That was probably our biggest challenge of what is this new term that just got invented? How do we do it? What is it? What isn't it? it can it involve government? Can it, does it have to be, you know, um, mutual aid? And so we're like, hey, let's partner with someone who we believe is already doing an awful lot of work in the public interest. That said, libraries do not have a perfect history. They've definitely discriminated uh, in the past before. Um, they're probably still doing it somewhat in, in the future, but, but by and large, they have a um, pretty good <laughs> reputation and, and do still do a, a lot of good. And it's a place where technology has not penetrated as deeply as it could. So we thought there's probably a lot of opportunities where, where we could help um, here. So yes, working concretely, but still we had to define those, those problems. I think we, we didn't go in with a particular case study or particular person or problem. We actually shied away from some of those because we kind of didn't really like a lot of the things that um, were being surfaced uh, to us by, by people in the space. A lot of those problems were, we built this thing and we don't know, no one's using it. Can you help? And I'm like, yeah, it's not <laughs> exactly where, where we want to go. We want to make sure that we have a problem and a group of users um, that's specific and solvable. Um, so, so that's where we started and um, it, libraries are nice because they're already basically about information technology. Parks and recreation, I think, would have been harder. There's uh, just less of an entry point there. Um, but we can now, I think, identify more fields where we could you know, go in, build up that expertise, and find PIT opportunities. So Stacy and Paul, I'm going to start with Stacy and um, the BU Law and MIT um, arrangement um, is interesting to me in that it kind of keeps lawyers and technologists in their traditional roles, right? The law students are offering advice, the technical students are providing the innovation. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the strengths and limitations of that particular approach. Why, you know, what, what do you think is useful from the public interest technology field building and, and what do you think are some of the limitations? Yeah, um, no, it's a good question. And it actually allows me to reflect on um, some of the similarities and differences between that context and some of the other contexts in which we've been doing interdisciplinary um, work across law and technology. So the, um, the partnership with MIT um, consists of um, two clinics, a technology law clinic and a startup law clinic, in which our um, law students under the supervision of um, lawyers, um, clinical instructors, um, provide legal advice to student innovators at both BU and MIT. And the, the, the virtue of this, I mean, there are many virtues, but one of the virtues is that um, the student innovators, before they go about doing their potentially risky um, uh, activity, can kind of come to us and get counseling about how to proceed in a way that minimizes risks. So there are legal risks associated with data scraping, with um, encryption research, you know, there are all sorts of um, uh, legal challenges that historically MIT students had found themselves in hot water about. And so it's empowering in many ways because um, the clinic allows them to get counseling before they go ahead and, um, uh, and do their work and try to, um, in some cases, uh, work with the potential target of the research um, to um, collaborate with them to move forward in a way that promotes knowledge um, without subjecting the students to, um, to legal action. But you're right, it does preserve this kind of lawyer-client relationship um, between um, our students um, and, uh, and the innovators. Um, 
we've been involved in a number of other uh, classes and projects um, that I think provide more of a bridge. So I teach a class called Law for Algorithms that involves half law students, half computer science students, um, and gets these uh, groups of students working together on sort of um, creative new technological approaches to solving some interesting legal um, dilemma, whether it's a privacy challenge uh, or um, a, a challenge that fair housing authorities are facing in uh, trying to cut back on um, the, the the transaction costs associated with getting people off lists um, and so forth. So, so that's an attempt to get people working together. And then a third thing that I just want to mention is Zebra Cranmer, who is involved in Pitt UN, she runs an organization within BU called Spark, which um, brings students on uh, technology, computer science, and other other students. Uh, together with clients um, to use tech tools to solve interesting, uh, challenging um, um, uh, questions. And she's partnered with our human trafficking clinic and the Massachusetts Attorney General's office um, on a student developed app for detecting and reporting victims of human trafficking. So, you know, these are opportunities for true interdisciplinary collaboration across departments in ways that, you know, really uh, promote the development of public interest technology um, solutions. Yeah, it's interesting to think about all the different opportunities. And, and I, many of you know, I was the director of the first law and technology and public policy clinic out at Berkeley. Um, I guess starting 20 years ago now, which makes me feel really old. Um, and it is interesting, you know, the, the challenge of we, I had PhD students from engineering and from the iSchool come to do projects. You know, we help libraries with, should we use RFID? Can we write a good RFP that helps us get what we want? Oh, the city is thinking about using surveillance cameras. What empirical work along with regulatory work might we do to kind of help them view it through a social justice lens. But there are a lot of like interesting challenges in taking law students who are engaged in legal practice and adding engineers, computer scientists, et cetera, and keeping kind of the expert relationship and, and thinking about how you do that and teach them good lawyering skills, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some really interesting challenges. Um, and so Paul, I wanted to turn to you. I know you and Stacy have been looking um, part of your PITUN supported initiative at how computer science and data science and the law are building out curricular innovations. Um, not just what you're doing, but kind of more broadly. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about, you know, what are the range of ways you see people trying to innovate in this space? And how much do they keep people in roles versus try to do things that are more interdisciplinary rather than multidisciplinary? Yeah, no, it's it's been a great process, and I'm I'm so thrilled to be partnering with Stacy and BU on it. And so we had um, 55 people. It was friends and family, but we asked friends of friends to come as well. And we, are, of course, we're going to have an in-person convening, and it turned into a big Zoom party. Um, and and we talked through not only pedagogy, but we also talked about how do you get tenure, how do you get hired, how do you convince you know your dean to fund whatever crazy off the wall thing you want to do. Our stated goal was a white paper, and, and we really wanted to kind of dive deeply into the question. And so it's law and CS for a reason. We thought by cabining it to those two fields, we could then go really, really deeply. Um, on pedagogy specifically, you know, I'm not very prescriptive. I wrote that chapter. I'm not very prescriptive about the right way to do it. I think a thousand flowers are blooming in really interesting ways. Um, and so we found people who did bring the two groups together and they play their roles. We found people who brought the two groups together uh, and they mix their roles. They learn how to do the thing the other knows. My mode of teaching has always been, I teach law students. I teach law students how to think like techies. And so let me just say a little bit more about my approach and the methodological question you asked a few minutes ago. I think it's interesting that Mahir and Lydia and I are all gonna say the same thing, which I think is still kind of a little counterintuitive, which is there's such a premium on breadth in, in law schools and probably in CS departments where we're gonna teach a little immigration law and we're gonna teach a little bit of criminal law and we're gonna teach you some corporate law. Um, whereas all of us with lived experience in the world know that there's something to be said about depth as well. Um, and what I've tried to do in my law classes that teach technology is I try and absurdly, absurdly go too deep 
go deeper than seems rational. So for example, in my uh, technology of privacy class, every student, these are law students, they get their own virtual machine. I teach them the Linux command line. I teach them, this is gonna be a deep, deep cut that only uh, a few of you will get. I teach them how to use all of the flags to the cut command in the Unix command line. And if you ever look at that, that is about as esoteric a piece of knowledge as you can ever acquire. And the reason I have them go through that painful exercise is because lawyers are really good at that. Lawyers are really, really, really good at being an inch wide and a mile deep. And I, I saw this when I clerked for a judge. I saw this when I summered at a patent firm. There are lawyers out there who know more about a particular technology than any technologist because they've just read every patent ever read on that question. Ask them about one thing just a step removed and their hope they're useless. But if you ask them about that, and I think that's an important thing to remind law students who wanna go into PIT UN and probably computer scientists who wanna go into PIT UN which is you shouldn't be afraid to have deep knowledge because if all you do is offer yourself out as, you know, I can skate the surface and hold my own and hopefully my own discipline knowledge will carry me through. That's not enough. Like, I think you need to learn to dive as deeply as possible. And I'm glad that I think I heard Mahir and Lydia say the same thing. So, so I'm super interested in like, what we think we need to do in order to kind of build bridges. And I, you know, it sounds like Paul, you're saying that some of this depth and like really going in the weeds and someone else's areas, you know, you know, my own thinking, I, I don't feel like my law students need to learn how to code. I do want them to understand technical standard setting. I want them to be able to read a technical standard. I want them to have, oh, how might we use, you know, a man in the middle proxy to actually look at what information is leaking from something. But it's really interesting to think about like what competencies, even if we're thinking about, um, you know, is it about architecture? Is it about code? Is it about where the things are developed and who participates? Like what we think, and it's in, we, we don't have a canon, right? There's no canon in this area. And so it's always really interesting to think about what it, what, what do we think we need to do to kind of like reach across the aisle? Um, so I want to go back to this question about some of the challenges with experiential learning. And I um, hear you mentioned the kind of different cadence of the academic cycle and being involved in policy processes. Um, Chris, I've also heard you talk about that a little bit. And I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about, you know, when you're trying to either work with a client or engage with a process that isn't on the academic calendar, um, how you're finding ways to kind of kludge things together to make that work. Um, because many of us want to have an impact in the world, you know, that we're trying to help our students find their voice, get their feet in this work. And so those connections are important, but we know that that's hard. And I'm wondering how you're managing that. Um, why don't we start with me here? Sure. Um, so I think what, what we've done is on some of the th projects, say, and we've given comments to the California AG on privacy law. We've given comments to the FTC. And that's proceeding on a particular cycle. And we have to get people together to contribute to those projects. And it works OK when um, it's an expert, an area of expertise for people and they're just contributing what they already know. But when it's a new knowledge, when you're trying to create some new data or trying to gather new evidence, it's hard to like create that cycle where you're ready to give that data over and, and plan longer term. And so that is one of the things I'm working on is to develop methods for um, creating sort of pipelines of evidence gathering that then can be available to the policymaker uh, when the policymaker is confronting these decisions. Chris, same question to you. Yeah, well, so I was just trying to think about it when, when Mihir was speaking. I mean, I think like one of the lessons we've learned is that, uh, I mean, I guess to your point, like if we really want impact in the world, we have to meet our partners where they are. And so oftentimes that means that we can't necessarily hold to the schedule that maybe I originally anticipated when we started the class. So uh, I provide a, a fair amount of flexibility to the students in terms of how they set up their sprints when they conduct their demos with the partners with, again, the, the realization that we really want impact. So if the goal is that they're going to make a 
meaningful and a demonstrable difference in the world that, that we have to make that the priority. I, I think one of the really exciting things that we've been able to do to broaden that is for the most promising projects, you know, whereby at the end of seven weeks, we actually have an MVP that actually looks like it might start solving some sort of a problem. We've been able, thanks to a new America to take those projects and actually turn them into full-time summer fellowships. Um, so the model that we're hoping this leads us to is that we can incubate ideas in the lab we can then lead to a good summer full-time experience where they continue building those ideas into real world open source products. And then, uh, you know, we're testing out this right now, then for, for some of even the best of th those good ideas, those actually can then become essentially the capstones for the master's students. So hopefully through that process, again, we're, we're finding their way, right way to fuse like an academic schedule with, with still leaving lasting impact in the world. And how about you, Paul? Um, I think the tech policy clinic has a fair number of staff and fellows that are probably pretty important to some of the continuity, but could you talk a little bit about how you manage the kind of different cadences between the quote unquote real world and the academic? Yeah, sometimes things just line up really well. Um, and I'm not, I've actually not taught in the clinics, but I've worked with the clinicians enough to know uh, what they face along these lines. So for example, I believe the Copyright Office is doing its triennial 1201 review, uh, and it happens to be that they had like a December 7th deadline. So it was a dream come true to all the law clinics. I bet they'll get a lot more law clinic participation. I bet they'll get better results because of it. So this is my open plea to all the government bureaucrats. Please look at the academic calendar when you're setting your schedule. I mean, I think the other one is probably similar to what Lydia experiences with the libraries, which is sometimes you could be cagey about picking a client that isn't so deadline driven. Um, and so we work a lot at Georgetown with nonprofits and the nonprofits say, you know, I've got this persistent data problem and it means I don't know if the intake is matching the results. And so there's no deadline. There's no, you know, we're not litigating. We're not walking into court with them. They can imagine, they can tolerate it. If we say, you know, for the next three months, we're going to be in summer, you're not going to hear from us. Um, and so it might be nice for someone who's never set up one of these clinics to try and do a little mix of that in your docket. Um, the other thing is if the clinics are the heroes of the world, and I'm looking at all of you who do this, I mean, a lot of the time you're just working without your students and you're just, you know, being a full-time lawyer <laughs> running a small law firm, except all your lawyers are now in final exams. Uh, I think that's just the plight of a law school clinician and probably pit UN technologist clinicians as we expand this model. Yeah, my husband can talk to you about that. Um, when the student gets sick and you have a deadline, right. not pretty. Okay, um, so I want to encourage folks who are in the audience to start shipping in some questions. Um, and I want to get in the, the weeds a little bit more about like the contents of people's classes as well as who they're teaching. So some of you are teaching um, graduate students, uh, JDs, maybe PhDs. Uh, I spend most of my time with graduate students. I do teach a large undergraduate class too. Some of you are teaching mostly undergraduates. Um, and I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, what, what are the actual contents of some of these classes? Paul was talking about, you know, teaching them how to use Linux. Um, but I'm, you know, wondering, Lydia, could you talk a little bit about like what, what's the meat of what you're teaching and your audience? I, I think it's undergrads, but I'm not sure. So, haha, what a funny question. So the computer scientists are almost entirely undergrads and they're very A plus driven. <laughs> and we have graduate students in journalism and architecture who are on pass fail. So you already have a align incentive alignment problem luckily everyone's been motivated enough by the problem that it's fine but everyone's on a different schedule they start on different days they end on different days they have different holidays in the middle of the semester i know all these are boring problems but they're all things that yours truly has to fix um so that's a reality uh, uh, of things that you just have to deal with um so who is it? And then, um, so when we taught the class the first time, I think the biggest problem was there was sort of a fight between the disciplines because we all thought our way was the best and we just kind of merged them. But the, the way, because we all do design in some way, shape or form, turns out they were more different than they were similar in terms of trying to get things done. So 
this is, and so there, there was a lot of just gaps of information for us to fit in. Um, I didn't realize that architects design, but don't build the things. And so we design and build. And when you, you, there's a totally different process you have to do when there's the reality of this has to get built. Um, and so that's what actually made us lean towards, okay, if we're going to be building technology, we're going to lean towards the framework of what technologists typically use and just a, sort of append things on to, to that uh, in terms of what we teach. And that then we had to teach the human centered design process to the architects and the journalists. This was another problem because <laughs> Chris, I don't know what your experience is, but architects don't seem to like design thinking, even though it has an awful lot to offer. And so I have to sort of give a very compressed 10 minute lecture on this is what prototyping is, this is what testing is so that now and the groups are mixed. And so the people who already know it can 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 fill in. I found that that is really important is to have when you have mixed teams, they will fill in each other uh, on topics. So that has has worked, but without some sort of grounding. So for example, user journeys is something that architects have never heard of. The idea of you don't just interview people and ask them, it's like, what did you do today? <laughs> You're a librarian. What did you do when you woke up? And then, and then, and then just to see what their actual flow of kind of the boring mundane things, because those were a lot of the problem sits. No one thinks to tell you like, oh my God, I hate filling out form X, Y, Z. But when you do that sort of journey towards you know, how did you help this patron uh, fill out their taxes or the citizenship? That's where this, this good information crops up. So we had to teach that and sort of reteach that um, a, a couple times because it's just where we found that we get a lot of the, the, the best insights. So I would say those are some of the, the teaching challenges. Uh, another I'll say is just like, misalignment of, of words and particularly human centered design uses a couple words that are very Silicon Valley capitalistic. So the main one that I kept using is like competitive analysis. The idea is figure out what's already out there so you don't repeat it and you steal the good ideas and leave the bad ones. But that's just not so but so we changed that to precedent analysis, which I think actually makes a lot more sense. And that's what architects do. Of course, you're not going to build this. You have to research what other what things have been built before and, and what's been done. So you don't repeat any of that. So same idea, just had to align the, the terms. But that's a big deal, too, as it turns out. If you use the wrong word and you will turn people on or off or they'll do something that you don't intend them to do. So lots of that continuously realigning people on a singular idea of what the process is and incorporating multiple terminologies and, and methodologies, but mostly aligning, I would say, to, to, to one framework for consistency. How about you, Chris? Yeah, I think I think a lot of what Lydia said resonates with me. So, so most of my students are master's students. Um, you know, we we kind of throw a lot of tools at them that, uh, that I found that I had to learn at 18 f So things like GitHub, um, Trello, how to set up a Kanban board using Slack, Mural, all these are really great collaboration tools and there's various levels of comfort with them. Um, but I think to Lydia's point, a, a good portion of our class also has to do with human-centered design and really building empathy with, with um, you know, the, the, pro the problem that, that they're trying to solve. And uh, those frameworks I think are easiest to learn just by experiencing them. So we do a lot of workshops. Um, we, we, we really encourage them to embrace the ambiguity. We actually wrote a policy innovation lab playbook, which was a collection of uh, lessons learned, both my own as well as that of the students in terms of like how to actually get through the class functionally uh, and and how to get through with a more positive experience kind of setting yourself up for, for some of the the you know that the, some of these processes are just going to be a little unusual and every class is a little bit different we try and take on a different subject every time the partners are always different so um, but I, but I think from from what I've heard from the students they really like that and they embrace it in the end because I think it does start to feel like a real world problem um, a real challenge yeah, it's interesting. So um, the ways in which you come to understand your client, the ways in which you manage projects, I guess some of it, 
coming from a law background, I teach, I actually use a fair amount of design methodologies, but I also spend a lot of time with computer scientists. Everybody has different conventions, right? Like as a lawyer, you really, and particularly when you're working with an institutional client, and I'm gonna turn this over maybe to Mahir and, and Stacy to, to talk a little bit about um, like who is your client and really understanding who can speak for the client and understanding the client's goals and you know getting students to understand what their job is, what questions they get to answer and what things are really at the client's discretion with the client, you know, um, very different than in design, right? Very different ways that you come to understand your client. It's not an intake interview, right? You do very different strategies. So it's super interesting to think about how um, you sensitize students to the strengths and weaknesses of different ways of knowing, right? How do you actually come to understand an organization, its goals, et cetera? Um, Mihir, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, I was thinking when you were mentioning that we have a project and, and reflecting what Paul was talking about, working with a client who uh, perhaps has a longer term horizon. So we have a project with the Wikimedia Foundation uh, and to deal with some of the issues there, they have on on the loud voices on their platform. And as I think about that, one of the key things that we try to have the students do and the other people working with us is to understand the client's perspective. And I think, you know, as, as a former defense lawyer and a prosecutor, that's sort of a natural, comes naturally to me, but it's just, you have to understand what the client cares about and what's driving them. And I think sometimes um, in the policy, in the tech policy world, we, we, we think of solutions to impose on people and we don't necessarily sort of ask, well, wh why do you do it the way you are? What do you care about? How do you think through these problems? And so, um, and, and I've heard feedback from clients who say just doing that has been fantastic because no one's actually sat around, you know, with a sociologist and a computer scientist and a, a security expert and you have, and you, and just ask me these questions from very different perspectives and that itself is a learning experience for the client so i think there's a there's a net positive there in terms of engaging with the client and and to just reflect on one point that paul you brought up i think there's the key to me is that you you have to develop ways to communicate across boundaries so while you're very deep you have to learn how to share your deep expertise with others and so this kind of client interaction gives that opportunity for students to learn how to communicate their deep knowledge with another person who has deep knowledge. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it to Stacy next and um, drawing out this insight from here, this uh, sometimes putting yourself in a room where a bunch of people who don't have your same assumptions, they don't have your same training, um, all of a sudden they start asking questions, right? Like when I, I teach law to non-law students, they're like, why'd they do that, right? Like that was a dumb way to do it. And law students, once in a while you'll get that, right? But often they're like, okay, let me write that down, right? Um, and I think the the lawyers, the law students often bring that to the computer scientists. They're like, what? that's shocking. You know, why would you think that was an okay thing to do, right? Because I like, registers in a different moral way with them. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the population you're teaching and, and some of the kind of core content. Uh, sure, I, I think, um, you know, I have sort of reflections both um, about the class that I teach, but also about the clinic and following up on Mihira's point and, and your initial question, Deirdre, about sort of the institution, sort of the, the interests of the client versus um, the sort of broader or kind of policy oriented goals of the clinic. I think one of the main reasons that we have this technology law clinic is because um, MIT initially, the institution um, really felt like um, there was no place for their students to turn to get advice that was really focused on their own desires and needs and, and concerns. Like students who were 
um, not being um, um, kind of captured by the um, the goals, the ideological goals or other goals of a particular um, clinic. Um, and they didn't have the ability to turn to um, like the general counsel's office at the university for, for legal advice. So that clinic is very much um, focused on the student as client, the student, you know, very student client centered um, goal, which is a really interesting experience um, for both sets of students, the law students and um, and the student clients. On the, in, in my class, the sort of the law for algorithms class um, that I teach, I do think there are really interesting kind of disconnects in the expectations that the students come to the class um, with. I think, um, you know, the, the law students, um, um, do have this um, kind of different set of expectations. I, I think um, I hear this a lot from um, lawyers and technologists. The law students assume that technology is going to be able to solve a problem, um, that there will be a tech solution, a perfect tech solution to the problem. And um, that the technologists assume that the law, you know, consists of a neat set of rules, right, that of course can effectively um, lead us to the optimal solution. And so one of the interesting um, areas in which um, we really engage is trying to bridge that gap um, in, in sort of different assumptions. No, you know, whatever technological solutions um, might be available are themselves highly imperfect and getting both sets of students to really kind of be prepared to interrogate um, and to have the language and the analytical um, skills to kind of interrogate um, the solutions that are provided um, by each set of disciplines. I know that doesn't quite answer your question directly, but, um, uh, but, but, but it is the, you know, what, one of the um, challenges that we face. That's great. Um, so, Paul, I'm going to let you close us out, and I um, want to ask you to reflect on something in particular that I think draws on what Stacy was just saying, and, and I think isn't that, um, aren't you credited with that maybe, the, right, the lawyers think the yeah, technology. Yeah, call it Fel Felton's third law is, is what Stacey third was. law, yes. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, I actually haven't found that at Berkeley. I, everybody's very skeptical about everybody else's capacity to fix problems. So I, I don't know if that's like a Berkeley thing, but um, some skepticism. Uh, but I am curious about one of the things that I do think is really useful um, in my own teaching experience is that the lawyers will often come in thinking, you know, like they look at things through a legal lens and, you know, you come from a social justice or a public, you know, advocacy environment where I did, right? Like you look at a problem and you're like, oh, well, is this a public relations issue? Is that like, what lever can I pull, right? Can I redesign the market? Do I need to go get a law passed? Can I get a really good article in the New York Times, right? How do I move the ball forward? And one of the things that I think is super valuable by bringing law and computer science students together, for example, I think they get a deeper appreciation of the solution space. It all of a sudden becomes broader, like, oh, I could protect privacy that way, or, oh, hmm, we could use some encryption over here, or maybe we want to, you know, redesign that database or whatever it is. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the broadening of the understanding of the solution space and, and the role that that plays in building this public interest technology field. Yeah, that's such a wonderful uh, question. And it's something I think a lot about. I mean, so computer scientists, and, and I should have said at the very outset, I was an undergraduate computer scientist and I'm a programmer and I defended networks. You're taught early on that there is an objective measure of your work and there is right or wrong. And, and you're also taught, I mean, I'm totally caricaturing here. You're also taught that the world is sort of a meritocracy where if you're smarter and a better coder and your students will win at the end of the day. Um, lawyers are taught the opposite, right? Lawyers are taught that it's unfair power structures all the way down. And what you need to do is learn how best to like find the persuasive hooks into this in this power system and what you and, and one of the things we
Uh oh, I think we've Paul has frozen. Um, I think what he was going to say is one of the important things here is helping them kind of get some of the sensibilities that come from the other fields, professional training and orientation, right? Like our fields are so rich. There's, there's the substance, there's the methods, and then there's like perspective about what problems are worth solving, our orientation towards problems. And I think by the, one of the benefits of bringing people who are studying in different home departments together is it, it can really rock their worlds, right? And um, my undergraduate class in data science behind the data, humans and values, you know, one of our early classes, we do the politics of artifacts, right? And then we talk about data and, and CAPTCHA and having these students, the computer scientists, they're like, oh my God, you just blew my mind. Data isn't data, right? Like it's the product of all of these decisions and of human action. And, and the social scientists are like, yeah, was that novel? Was that something new? Um, but, you know, bringing them together is just so important for that reason. It's like really profoundly eye-opening to realize that other disciplines come with their own perspectives and that thinking um, through those other, the lenses of those other disciplines can help you think differently about what problems you want to solve, what problems you can solve, um, and what goals you might think about achieving. So I think that's really valuable. All right, so our last two minutes, I want to give you each um, a, an opportunity to say, here's the question Deirdre should ask me that she didn't, and here's what I think about it. And I'm going to start, we're going to go in alphabetical order with Chris. Oh, sure. All right. I, I'll be quick. Um, I I would love to, I, I, I guess maybe the question that I would have loved to have discussed was how can we all collaborate more? Um, and I don't have a perfect answer for that, but please let's collaborate. <laughs> I'd love to learn. I, I, you know, what I can find online is always so fascinating. If we can find ways to really leverage what each of us is doing in the classroom and share our shared experiences in our own multidisciplinary uh, format, I think that would be wonderful. Terrific. Lydia. One of the struggles in, in our class, we're largely designing for low income US people and designing technology for uh, rich people is actually easy. They all have an iPad, they all have a phone, but there's a variety of access to digital tools um, in, uh, with, with, um, with, with lower, uh, so like not everyone has broadband, for example. Most people don't have a desktop. And there's just a greater variety there, and that has created quite a design um, challenge for us. And I think that's knowledge that we could, if we got together, we, we, we could sort of share. It's so like we actually, a lot of our students built texting services <laughs> that you could use from a smartphone or a dumb phone or uh, anything. So that was an interesting solution type we came up with. Mihir, 10 seconds. Uh, the thing I would like us to talk more about, which we have and we continue to do, is to talk about systemic bias and how we can address that, all of us together. Uh, that continues to be, and, and Lydia, you touched on that. Stacy. Um, I'm interested in thinking about um, what the baseline is, how we get to a, a common baseline of understanding so that we can get our students to actually work forward um, together on problems. That's a big challenge, I think, in this kind of teaching. Terrific. Well, thank you all so much um, for all you shared today and for the work that you're doing to move the PIT field forward through your educational and research efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.